it is well with my soul, even after experiencing all that. Now tonight, can you say that as well with my soul? Can you say that, what, what, what you're going through? I pray that you'll be able to say that. Um, tonight, we're going to be looking at some scriptures in Genesis, the last part of the book of Genesis. Um, we're not going to start in Genesis 1-1 in the beginning. We're going to start toward the, the end of Genesis. But I want us to talk about how you and I can be great for God. How you and I can be great for God. And we're going to use the example of Joseph and read a lot about him tonight. We're going to do a lot of scripture reading with very little commentary from me, but that's okay. It's probably better for you. But history has recorded several individuals who have adopted the name great. And if you're a follower of history or maybe studied in, in history in college or in high school, you have probably learned about Peter the Great, the first emperor of Russia. And he adopted that name with the ambitious thought that he was great. But if you study his lifestyle closely, you'll discover that Peter the Great had a violent, very violent temper and was given to fits of rage. And one day he killed his own son in a fit of rage. Of course, we also are familiar with Alexander the Great. He adopted that name as well, the Great. Uh, and we know that he conquered empires and ruled the, the known world of his day. Yet Alexander the Great, who conquered the worlds, could not conquer his own flesh. He was given the drunken brawls, which is, in one inst instance, he killed his favorite general and friend, Cletus. We know another person from the Bible named Herod the Great. You know him from New Testament times. He was a man who built the temple and organized the nation, yet Herod was given the fits of jealousy, and that would, later he would take the lives of his wife and his children because he was jealous or afraid that they would take the throne from him. Imagine that. You know, what the world may consider great is something other than what the Bible considers great. So I wanted to take a look at this man, Joseph, and I, I, I deem him as a, a man that was great for God. And we're, we're, by the time we're through tonight, you'll, you'll see why I'm saying that. So turn over to Genesis chapter 46. Genesis chapter 46. And the first thing I notice about um, Joseph is his commitment to using his authority wisely. Look at Genesis chapter 46 and verse 31, and we read, Joseph said to his brothers, Joseph said to his brothers and his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh and will say to him, my brothers and my father's household who in the land of Canaan have come to me. So the story of how Joseph and his family was uh, reunited is recorded earlier in the book of Genesis. But look at verse 32. Joseph said to his brothers, And the men are shepherds, for they have been keepers of the livestock, and they have brought their flocks and their herds and, and all that they have. When Pharaoh calls you and says, What is your occupation? You shall say, Your servants have been keepers of livestock from your youth, even until now, both we and our fathers, that you may live in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is loathsome to the Egyptians. Now, that's an important thing. You might want to take note of that, the land of Goshen. And that's the whole purpose of this interview, by the way, because Joseph wants to grant this land of Goshen to his family. It is, it is interesting that Joseph, he never abuses his authority. Not now, not before, and not after. He will rule as premier of Egypt for nearly 100 years. And so you see in these verses what he's doing He's introducing his brothers and his father to Pharaoh. They have come into the land, and obviously Joseph wants to take, he wants to take good care of his family, his father and brothers. Uh, and they, of course, were shepherds. They, they must settle in the only place that would accommodate sheep. And that is the valley land, the delta region known as Goshen. Now Joseph, he being the, the greatest authority in the land of Egypt, other than Pharaoh, of course, he has every right and all authority to tell his brothers, hey, you sell in Goshen, 
don't worry about a thing. I am will handle the rest. I'm premier of Egypt. I'm the prime minister. What I say goes. And we don't worry about Pharaoh because he's a friend of mine, by the way. And who cares what the people may say because I'm the top banana here. And they'll know that you're given the most fertile region in Egypt and there's famine in the land. But don't worry about that. They just go to, go to Goshen and live. Now, Joseph had every right to say that, but he doesn't. What does he do? He tells his brothers, let's go to Pharaoh. Let Pharaoh make the decision, okay? And that's later in chapter 47, and we, we see later in chapter 47 that we discover that, that Pharaoh, he says, okay, go live in the land of Goshen, just like Joseph says is going to happen. Now, Pharaoh, and I'm sure Joseph talked to Pharaoh before he, uh, Pharaoh met his brothers and father, and Pharaoh probably is taking credit for the idea, right? And I think that's kind of humorous. Sometimes you just plant a seed with somebody and just throw that thought out there, and they think it's the greatest and the wonderfulest idea it is. It's their idea. Go, oh, yeah, let's do it, let's do it, do it. And you just throw that little seed out there. I can imagine this is what happened with, with Joseph and, and Pharaoh. Uh, but he allowed Pharaoh to make the decision. One of the most <clears throat> discouraging things in the workforce can be working for a manager or a boss or, uh, or a company who abuses their authority. Tragically, sometimes these people in authority, they may even call themselves Christians. And all of a sudden they're promoted to this place of leadership or authority, and you sit back and say, wow, this, didn't this guy change when he was given that position? I remember when he was this, but now look at him. He never talked like that before. He never did things like that. You can't even get close to the guy. You can't even speak with the guy. Cause, and I worked with him for 15 years, but now you can't get nowhere near him. It has been said that the greatest test of a man or woman's character is authority. Give them a little power. Give them authority and see what that does to them um, and see how they respond. So you'll really learn in a hurry whether they have true greatness or not. But Joseph, he never abuses his authority as prime minister in the land. The second thing about Joseph that I see that impresses me, that he's willing to live and act in humility. Look at uh, chapter 47 in verse 1. Joseph is willing to live a humble life. Then Joseph went in and told Pharaoh and said, My father and my brothers and flocks and their herds, and they all have come, come out of the land of Canaan, and behold, they're in the land of Goshen. In other words, Pharaoh, they're waiting for your approval. Now look at verse 2. Yeah, verse 2 of chapter 47. He took five brothers and presented them to Pharaoh. Now you remember the shepherds, they were kind of repulsive to the Egyptians. I don't exactly know why that is, but in verse 3, we see then Pharaoh said to his brothers, what is your occupation? They said to Pharaoh, your servants are shepherds, both we and our fathers. Now I'm kind of wondering, well, what's going on in Joseph's mind at this time? He's standing next to his brothers, and I wonder if he had the temptation, don't say that, don't tell them that you're sheep herders. Um, Tell them that we're just uh, land moguls. So we, you know, we, we deal in land, large tracts of real estate. Don't mention that you're shepherds. Because shepherds were, were considered undesirables in that time. But Joseph is going to tell the truth. And archaeologists have discovered uh, Egyptian art dating back to the time of Abraham uh, and Isaac and Jacob. And that artwork depicts that shepherds on occasion... Uh, they were pictured as these kind of wicked-looking, scary-looking people or whatever. And I don't know the reason for that, but the Egyptians considered uh, shepherds as loathsome, and they were hated, and they were despised. And in that day, the shepherds were the lowest caste of society. And some of that at attitude also carried over into Israel in the New Testament times, by the way. The shepherds were very lowly individuals. Now, it's interesting that God would give the message of his son, Jesus Christ, the shepherd, right? I find that amazing. 
However, in these verses, we see an interesting characteristic of Joseph's character. He's willing to live with the knowledge that he's from the line of shepherds. And that, of course, would be spread like wildfire across the country. His father's a shepherd. His brothers are shepherds. And I can imagine him hearing or thinking that, well, what will people say? What will these people say or what will these people do? Will they be willing to follow a shepherd? Will they obey me as premier as being, knowing that I'm a shepherd or a keeper of the sheep? So in a way, Joseph, by him being honest here and telling the truth, he kind of risks some of his credibility here with the people. But he's honest and he's humble. Someone wrote well, they said this, one who knows God well will be humble. One who knows himself well will never be proud. The next thing about Joseph, he's able to administrate. Okay? He's, he's, he's able to run things, honestly. Um, look at verse 13 in chapter 47, and you'll see the honesty in his administration, how he does things. It says, there was no food in the land of all Egypt because the famine was very severe. So the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished because of the famine. Joseph gathered all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan for the grain which they bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. When the money was all spent in the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, give us food for why should we die in your presence? For our money is gone. Then Joseph says, give up your livestock and I will give you food for your livestock since your money is gone. In other words, this is a type of welfare system, by the way, but it wasn't a handout. They had to pay a meager amount for what they got. This is, they had to give something in exchange for food. Okay. Finally, their money is gone. Their livestock is gone as well. And, you know, one thing that we often overlook, it says that Joseph was given all the money, right? He was given all. He, he was uh, handling the gross national product of Egypt himself. It was all in his hands. Uh, he had a key to the pantry, so to speak. So he was, the, he was the one who had the meal ticket for the entire nation, and they brought all the money to him. Now, I can imagine that probably literally millions of do dollars in gold and silver probably went through, uh, trickled through the hands of Joseph. What did he do with it all? He did what he was supposed to do with it. He brought it into Pharaoh's house because Pharaoh entrusted him to serve. Pharaoh picked a good one in Joseph, did he not? You know, if there ever was a time in Joseph's life when he could have well, padded his account, so to speak, uh, and maybe think about retiring early. This was it, because he had a gold mine at his disposal. He could have thought, you know what, nobody checks behind me. I'm unaccountable. Nobody keeps up with me. Nobody's keep, keeping the books. I can cook the books any way I want to. Nonetheless, that's what, that's what he could have said, but he doesn't, because Joseph's a man of God, and he's working for God. And, you know, um, maybe Joseph, Joseph had people coming to him saying, we'll do anything for you, Joseph. Just, we'll give you all the money just for food. Here, take our livestock. Jo jo uh, Joseph, he allows himself to be a funnel, so to speak. And that's an interesting mark, a great mark of his character. He was a ministering what he had. He was a good steward of what God entrusted him to do. George Mueller, in his, life, in his lifetime, probably took care of maybe you know, 10,000 orphans, because that's what he did, by the way. And it's said that more than $8 million came to George Mueller as a result of prayer. Yet when he died, all his accounts were tallied up, and he owned less than $1,000 in his name. Okay? So he, he had access to millions too, but he chose to do what God had called him to do with that money. Somebody else that kind of strikes me as interesting from the Old Testament is Nehemiah. Remember Nehemiah was building the walls of Jerusalem? And the world, they're saying, well, how can you get, how can someone build these walls and have all that responsibility to build the wall 
the walls and restore the city without some kind of financial gain in mind, right? Why would you build a, ki a kingdom if you're going, to, if you're not to become wealthy and be live like a fat cat? Probably what some of these people were thinking. Nehemiah is there, he's building a wall, and finally his enemies say to him, we know why you're building a wall, Nehemiah. We know why you're doing it. Because you want to be the governor, and you want to receive the governor's salary. Nehemiah, he responded, in effect, I have not, and I will not receive all the benefits of being a governor. Well, who was Nehemiah working for? He was working for God, right? And when you, when you truly surrender to God and you in his work, yeah, it's nice to have money. You need money to live, right? But that's not why you're doing it. You're not doing it for the applause of men either. You're doing it for God and his glory. Now, Sam Ballot and Tobiah and Gisham, back in the days of Nehemiah, they're probably scratching their head outside the wall. What's, what's, what's wrong? What's going on with Nehemiah? What's making him tick? Yeah. What makes him do this, what he's doing? And the Egyptians were probably saying the same thing about Joseph, some of them. You know, what in the world is uh, Joseph's motivator here. We, we just can't figure this guy out. Let me ask a question that I ask myself. When you're unaccountable to anybody, no one checking behind you, no one doing anything, and when it's just you, and when you have the opportunity, and when you're alone with yourself, are you honest? Are you, are you completely honest? Say, for instance, you're in the store somewhere and the clerk gives you too much change back. Do you count your change and go back and return that change? Or you just put in your pocket, well, it's a blessing from the Lord. <laughs> well, one thing, you're a liar and you're stealing something that's not yours. So if you've got an ounce of salvation, an ounce of testimony, and you go back and return that and say, ma'am, you paid me too much. What they do with it after that is up to them. But you return it because that's the right thing to do. That was, that, that, that'll open the door for conversation about the Lord Jesus Christ. It really will. Another thing about Joseph that sticks out at me that is Joseph's desire to serve others unselfishly. Look at verse 23 of chapter 47. Then Joseph, verse 23 of 47... Then Joseph said to the people, Behold, I have today brought you, bought you, in your land for Pharaoh. The people, well, the people pretty much came tenant, became tenant farmers. It's kind of like the, the feudal system in, in the Middle Ages. Uh, but note what Joseph does in the last part of verse 23. He says, Now here is some seed for you that you may sow the land. You know, it's interesting that when the country comes to the, uh, the end of the famine and the people still have their dignity and their self-respect because of what Joseph was doing. Joseph was serving with the people in mind. I'm serving, I'm just not giving handouts, I'm helping them to better their lives. And it paid off for the long term. And look at verse 24, this is what he says, at the harvest you shall give a fifth to Pharaoh and four fifths shall be your own seed for the field and for your food and for those of your households and as food for your little ones. That's a 20% tax, by the way. Now, some people, well, I'm criticizing look at him, he's charging taxes, look at him. They might have been convinced that Joseph's out for himself. Yet, archaeology has helped us in finding out and discovering that the neighboring countries of Egypt, many times they exercise more than 50% tax. 50% of your income went to taxes. Joseph, he's just requiring 20%. You know, um, Joseph is pretty much saying, I'll just take 20%, that's enough to handle the administrative, administrative fees. Shipping and handling, okay. What you see on those info commercials, Okay, they tell you something, it costs $9.95, but then you got to pay another 20 bucks for shipping and handling. Okay, that's not what Joseph's doing here. He's just 20% off the top for, for, for administrative fees. But keep the system going. And he says, well, we'll take care of your cattle, we'll provide the seed, you just give us one-fifth. 
You know, in light of what was taking place, I find, as I read the scriptures about Joseph, he was just uh, very compassionate and unselfish in what he was doing. He served the people with them in mind, right? And if you're in the business of serving people, you have to have them in mind. I don't know if the Holy Spirit is going to actually use people if we're selfish and doing things off, well, what can I get out of it, you know? Maybe somebody's, let me be real. Now, sometimes people uh, ask you something and whatever, and maybe you're doing some wheeling, dealing, or whatever, or promise to do something. Well, what can I get out of it? Have you ever said that? <coughs> I have before. What's in it for me, right? Why am I doing it? What's in it for me? And quickly I have to remind myself, that's not what the Lord wants me. That's not what he, how he wants me to respond. What's in it for me? I remember my father, um, growing up as a boy, he, and this is before he became a Christian, he was always willing to help other people. And he always dragged me along to help. And of course, as a teenager who, you know, Saturday, he'd be helping somebody put up a fence or build a barn or something, and I'm out there too dragging around. Man, I'd really be somewhere playing football or doing something. I sure wouldn't want to be here. I'd rather be doing something else. And I, sometimes I'd say, he'd say, all right, let's go. We're getting up 7 o'clock. We're going to Mr. So-and-so's house, and we're going to help him put up his fence for his goats. And I'm saying, what's in it for me? You know? And sometimes, what's in it for me? He said, I get you lunch. How's that? And lunch wasn't no Hardee's and McDonald's. It was back to my house to eat lunch, okay? Because <laughs> my parents didn't, we didn't go out to eat. I mean, it was, if you went out to eat twice a year, you were doing something. And I don't even remember that. So everything was cooked at home, you know? So, and that, and that, was, that was fine. So nobody starved. And so I learned a lot of valuable lessons. To not be home on Saturday when he's doing all these jobs. <laughs> Go before he, can, before he can get me. But okay. But Joseph served the people, served the people with them in mind. And if there's any doubt about this, look at verse 25. So they said, You have saved our lives. That's what the people are telling. You, you have saved our lives. They didn't say, Joseph, you was just uncompassionate. They didn't say that uh, you're just desires of all that we have, or they didn't say you're ripping us off. The people say to Joseph, you have saved our lives. Let us find favor in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's slaves. Otherwise, they're saying, we'll serve you faithfully, because you was looking out. Isn't it, isn't it easy to serve somebody who's looking out for you in your best interest? Isn't it easy to do that? Wow, it sure is. You know, and that's why we serve the Lord Jesus Christ, because he has our best interests in heart, in mind. You know, one of as we think about that, you think about the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 13 when he was in the upper room. Uh, in the big thought of disciples' mind, they want to know, well, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom, right? They're asking that question. They're whispering, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? And, what they're, and probably what the intent was, well, what does God consider great? What is a mark of character that God takes note of? Who would be the greatest among us here? So in that room, in the upper room that night, as they had already reclined to eat, the slaves were not there. Nobody wanted to wash their own feet, certainly one another's feet, right? Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord, King of kings and Lord of lords, he takes out a towel and he uh, takes up his gown and he ties it up around him. And then he goes to Peter, he takes Peter's feet and puts them in the, in the water basin, and he says, Peter, I want to wash your feet. Peter, in the, in, in the text, he literally draws, takes his feet out and said, no, you can't wash my feet. Then the Lord gives them a theological lesson in being in Christ. And finally, Peter humbles himself, and he acknowledges the sovereignty of God, and he allows Jesus, the Lord of heavens, to wash his feet. And Jesus goes around, washing all the disciples' feet. Can you imagine being in that room that night? I bet it was quiet as could be. You could probably hear a pin drop. I, I think the chatter was done by then. The only thing you would hear was the splashing in the water of that basin or that pan that Jesus was using to wash the disciples' feet. And I bet if you looked around and if you looked in the face of each disciple, you probably seen tears rolling down their eyes about what the Lord Jesus was doing for them. Because there they sat and they watched God in the flesh ministering to them 
in the lowliest way. So, the world measures greatness by how many people serve you. God measures greatness by how many people you serve. How many people you serve. That's what God looks at. Another thing that I notice about Joseph is his genuineness or his transparency to grieve openly. You know, sometimes in church we wear a mask, right? Right? Sometimes, sometimes people do. And so somebody told me one time, you need to change your mask because that, that one you have now is looking awful ragged looking. But that's okay. This is all I got. All right? This is the best I got. But look at verse, um, in chapter 49, chapter 49, turn over, chapter 49, and let's look at 20, verse 29. This is Jacob, Joseph's father, on his deathbed. And it says, And the, then he, Jacob, charged them and said to them, I'm about to be gathered to my people. Bury me, and my father's in the cave, that is in the field of Ephron, the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machbelah, which is before Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Abraham brought along with the field from Ephron, the Hittite, for a burial site. Then they buried Abraham and his wife Sarah. There they buried Isaac and his wife Rebekah. And there I buried Leah, the, the field in the cave that is in it, purchased from the sons of Heth. When Jacob finished charging his sons, he drew his feet into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. Well, what is Joseph going to do now? Here this great man, a man who trusted God and his sovereignty and trusted God with his unwavering faith, how will this man respond? Will he smile and say, oh, well, they're in a better place now. You know, I'll see him one day that he's in heaven. He has the transparency to grieve publicly. Now look at chapter 50, chapter 50, in verse 1 and 2. This is Joseph. Then Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. Joseph wanted to give his father Jacob the greatest burial Egypt had ever seen. Now drop down to verse 3. Now 40 days were required for it, for such is the period required for embalming, 40 days. And the Egyptians wept for him 70 days. 40 days was the requirement for the embalming period, but note that, notice that the, the Egyptians mourned and grieved for Jacob an additional 30 days. They must have really loved Joseph and Jacob. They got to love him as well. Now look at verse 7 and 8 in chapter, chapter 50. So Je Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his household, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, and all the households of Joseph, and his brothers and his father's household. Now drop down to verse, verse, verse 10. When they came to the threshing for Atad, which is beyond Jordan, they lamented there with a very great and sorrowful lamentation, and he observed seven days mourning for his father. Now when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning of the threshing floor of Atad, they said, this is a grievous mourning for the Egyptians. Therefore, it was named Abel Mizraim. Abel Mizraim means weeping, which is beyond the Jordan. Now, Maybe some people say, aha, that's his weakness right there. He's a big showboat. He's making a big spectacle of all this. You know, this is scriptural, him grieving. This, this is a real man here. Yeah, he's a great man of God, but he's a real man. He's grieving. He's not trying to hide. And he's going to share that with his support system, by the way. You know, sometimes Christians say, well, why don't you just get over it? You know, good grief, just get over it. And I, I tend to think that there's many people, maybe here tonight, many Christians, they might need a good cry. They, they might need to have a good laugh, by the way. <clears throat> I used to work with this guy years ago uh, at the Naval Shipyard, and Tommy, he told me he'd get up 5 o'clock every morning. I said, what would you do that early in the morning? He said, I'd like to watch the Three Stooges. 
And so he was, <laughs> he was always in a good, well, I like to watch Three Stooges too, but he was always in a good mood and always kind of joke. He didn't do a whole lot of work, but he's always in a good mood any, anyway. But some people need a good laugh. Maybe a good cry would serve them well because they bottle things up. They bottle their problems up, the difficulties. They harbor resentments. They just have that sometimes grief forever and ever and ever. And some people sometimes want to tell them, why don't you just keep your chin up? There's no need to cry here. Get a hold of yourself. Well, we kind of miss the boat if we say like that because Joseph was secure enough as a man. He was secure enough in his faith that he was able to grieve and weep for his father. What did Jesus do when he was at the, the tomb of Lazarus? What did he do? He wept. And also said he looked over the city of Jerusalem and said, weeping, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem. Sometimes it can be a strength to reveal emotions. It's not a weakness. The next thing about Joseph that I noticed that he had the capacity to forgive. Forgive graciously. Remember how he got into Egypt to begin with? You know, this, this is the... After, Joseph, after Jacob dies, this is one of the most, to me, one of the most beautiful texts in the scriptures, what transpires after that. Joseph's brothers, of course, Jacob's gone. Jacob probably held the fam family together. You know, they might have been thinking, the brothers, well, Joseph won't do anything to me as long as daddy's alive or daddy ain't here no more. Who's protecting me? Joseph could have very easily had a vindictive attitude and want to kill his brothers. but Because they're the ones who sold him into slavery anyway, right? Now this, this is more than 20 years later this happens, by the way. And this is what transpires in verse 17. Look at verse 17. <clears throat> we read, Please forgive, I beg you, the transgression of your brothers and their sin, for they did you wrong. Verse 18 says, then his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, behold, we are your servants. Now, look at Joseph's response here in verse 19. This is compassion and his grace to forgive his brothers. But Joseph said unto them, do not be afraid, for I am God, I am in God's place. As for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide you, I will provide for you and your little ones. So through all the events that God's hand was, was in and on, he saved the Israelites because they would have surely starved to death. But God put Joseph right in the place that he needed to be to save the nation and to save the country of Egypt as well. You know, something I really wanted for us to, to kind of grab our mind around is this. The capacity to forgive like this is dependent upon our ability to see God at work in the lives of other people to see how God is working in other people. Yeah, sometimes people might be mean and ugly to you. But you know what? We can forgive those people if we choose to. Many times we choose not to. We want to hold grudges against them. I hold that grudge for 50 years and still holding grudges. You know, when someone uh, impacts us in a certain way, when somebody criticizes us, when somebody says something to, to tear us down, when somebody attacks us, when somebody is less gracious, they can be tools in the hands of God to develop us or to mold us or to shape us some kind of way. Joseph, he seen this whole event. He, he viewed his brothers as simply the tools of God, the tools in the hands of God to bring about this result. Wow, that's pretty profound, right? God really has to be in control of somebody's life for them or, in order to do that. The next thing about Joseph, which I find great, is his confidence to die as a visionary. Look at verse 22 and 23 of chapter 50. 22 and 23. Now Joseph stayed in Egypt, he and his father's household, 
and Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph saw the third generation of Ephraim's sons, also the sons of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were born on Joseph's knees. In other words, Joseph saw his great-grandsons. He was there. Now look at verse 34. Joseph says to his brothers, I'm about to die. But God will surely take care of you and bring you up from this land to the land which he promised on an oath to Abraham through Isaac and Jacob. Now what was that promise? What was that promise that, that Joseph is recalling, that he's remembering? That the Israelites would be in that land, in that promised land that God had promised Abraham. See, Joseph never forgot that. He remembers this. Now, God gave a, the covenant promise to Abraham that Abraham would be a great nation. Abraham only had one son. He repeated the covenant promises to Isaac. I'll make you a great nation. And he had two sons. Then Jacob, he repeated again, Jacob had 12 sons. In three generations, there's a tribe of about 70 people here. Now, are you grabbing this, holding on to this? Joseph died a visionary. Now, two things about Joseph here, about the vision here. Um, he had a vision of God's faithfulness. He knew that God was faithful in what God had promised to do. He made his brothers, in verse 25, swear, so to speak. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely take care of you. you know, he was also confident of Israel's future. And the last part of verse 25 tells us, and you shall carry my bones up from here. You shall, okay, when I depart, you'll carry my bones from here. He said, look, when God finally fulfills the promise of the land, don't leave me in Egypt, bring my body. I want to be in the land. God, of course, will fulfill that promise. So how could Joseph die with such a vision as that? Because he lived with such a vision that God was faithful. So what has that got to do with you and I tonight? All right? Would you like to die like Joseph? Okay. Yeah, but not tonight. Okay, so the, the actual question is, not do you want to die like Joseph, do you want to live like Joseph? Yeah. As one person said, are we chained to the status quo, the same old, same old, afraid to try, afraid to risk, afraid to change, afraid to go, afraid to do something that we may feel like God may want us to do? Where is your vision in serving the Lord Jesus Christ? Living a life with vision will determine the way you die, by the way. You know, I don't, I don't, well, it's been a while now. I read obituaries, right? You ever do that? You know, you get in the paper and you and you're looking so and so, and you're looking through names, see if you know anybody, like right, that. And so, the young people are dying, old people are dying. It reminds me of the brevity of life. Let me read some last words of some people. Uh, some lost, some saved. This is um, Hector Berlioz, Berlioz, and he was a, a French composer who spoke and wrote kind of like Shakespeare. But before he died, this is what he said. Life is but a walk. No, he's lost. He's a lost man. Life is but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury. Life signifies nothing. Okay? That was his testimony. Of course, he didn't know, know the Lord. Isaac Watts, who lived 50 years before this gentleman, this is what he said. And he wrote a lot of one. Isaac Watts wrote a lot. A lot of wonderful hymns that we still sing today. When I survey the, 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 the wondrous cross and, oh God, our help is in ages past. This is what Isaac Watts said in his dying testimony. This is what he says. It is a great mercy that I have no manner of fear or dread of death. I can lay my head back and die without terror this afternoon. And then he did. He died without terror, without fear. Martin Luther, you remember him, he was a monk who shook the world, okay, and, and he's been credited with the uh, conceiving Protestantism. Uh, and you and I still benefit 
from his work today. But as Luther was lying on his deathbed uh, with his closest friends about him, he said this, he repeated this phrase three times, Into thy hands I commend my spirit, thou hast redeemed me, O God of truth. Into thy hands I commend my spirit, thou hast redeemed me, O God of truth. Then he breathed his last breath. Then as he was going through his, you know, breathing his last breath, he repeated John 3.16, and then he also quoted his favorite verse, Psalm 68, verse 20, that says this, Our God is the God of whom cometh salvation. God is the Lord by whom we shall escape death. Wow. I don't know about you, but I like to die like that. Do you know what it takes? Living like that in order to die like that. Allowing the Holy Spirit of God to stamp upon our lives, to stamp upon our character, the mark of true greatness. Using authority, those that have authority, okay, use it, it wisely as a parent or employer. Being an administrator, honestly, being honest with people, okay. Serving others that desire to serve others. And also, Grieving openly, be filled to share with certain people your emotions and what you might be struggling with. You know, the church is a hospital for people, right? As we minister to one another and care for one another. And also, last but not least, being able to forgive graciously. Sometimes we lack forgiveness. We just harbor things forever sometimes with people. Well, I remember when they did this. or I re Well, maybe you ought to forget when they did this or did that. Greatness... folks, is not developing empires, but developing great and godly character. That's the mark of true greatness. Greatness is not in leading men, but in leading our lives in such a way that God is pleased, where he might say, well done, my faithful servant. Greatness is not measured by, our, by the world's standards, by the way, but not in receiving the applause of men, but receiving the approval of God. And then the last verse of chapter 50, it says, So Joseph died at the age of 110 years, and he was embalmed and placed, temporarily of course, in the coffin in Egypt. He wouldn't stay there. End of the chapter end of the book, but not the end of the story, by the way. There's more to this story because the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, and the God of Joseph is a still alive today. Yes, God is alive today. And he's just as available in our day to stamp his Holy Spirit seal of approval upon you, upon your character and mine, if we generally, genuinely want to fully surrender to him and allow him to make us great in his eyes. But in order for anyone to be great for God, you have to know him as your Lord and your Savior. And I would like to ask you tonight, do you truly know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If not, I want you to give that some thought. But not only give it some thought, I also want you to seek out somebody. I'm going to be here for a little while after service. Keith will be here for a few minutes. If you're not sure where you're going to spend eternity at when you die, maybe you need to get saved. And don't put it off, because if you really want to be great for God, you got to, it's, that's where it all starts. Well, I'm through. Let's bow for a moment of prayer.